If we go for a moment to the book of Genesis, chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18, verse 17. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed? For I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. Here we see the great promises of God with regard to Abraham in time with regard to the nation of Israel. But I want you to see in the midst of this God's concern for the family. God's concern for the family. Abraham's family. Verse 19, For I have chosen him. He doesn't say so that he might evangelize the nations. It doesn't say so that he might be a great church planter. It says, I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. So he has commanded him to care for a family. And the impact of caring for a family is absolutely phenomenal. And it is important before God. Now, There are many people who are so involved in ministry and so involved in things such as that in the name of Jesus Christ that they have little time for their family. They are deceiving themselves, they are in sin, and they are hurting their family. Let me ask you a question. Is there anyone in the Old Covenant more important than Moses? Not really. You think about the Old Covenant... You think about Moses. Do you think that there's anybody in here, in this room, that's going to have a ministry with more impact than Moses? God sent Moses down to Egypt to deliver a people. His entire redemptive plan for Israel is founded upon this man, Moses. He was very, very important, and I doubt very seriously whether any of us will have such a ministry. But as Moses was headed toward Egypt to do God's will, God met him in the way to kill him. And why did he meet him in the way to kill him? Because he had not circumcised his son. He had not done the duty of a father to his children. God was going to do some radically different things because of the disobedience of a man. Now we know in God's providence He saw it through, worked it out. But what I want you to see is this. If you're a single man and you want as a single man to preach and minister 24 hours a day without stop, then you do that. Praise the Lord. Don't sleep. Don't eat. Preach, witness, do all those things. And you can. Why? Because there are portions of Scripture that have nothing to do with you as a single man. You are free from many of the commands of God because you are single. But when you take a wife, then many of the Scriptures that in your singleness did not apply to you, they now apply to you. And your life and ministry has to change. And then, from there, after you take a wife, you are still free from certain commands. Why? Because you do not have children. But when, in God's providence, He gives you children, then your life as a couple must change. In the West, we are seeing the disintegration of the family. And in many places in the West, the family is already disintegrated, destroyed, gone. 
The birth rate now in Europe is in such a state among Europeans that they will never recover. Do you realize that? Do you realize that your birth rate now as Europeans is to such a low degree it has fallen beyond the number that historically a people can recover? You will not recover. Because you did not see that family and the raising of children is one of the greatest blessings that can ever be given to individuals. You will not recover as a nation. The United States is about to drop below that statistical mark itself. But most of the European countries are already there. It means you will never recover as a people. Because we have been taught to despise the family to despise God's institution of marriage, to despise God's institution of giving ourselves in the most intimate relationships, spouses, parents, and children. Now, first of all, I want us to deal with something that I think is very, very important. If I Honestly, if I had my way, I wouldn't go anywhere this afternoon and I wouldn't preach evangelistically tonight. Why? Because this is so important. And if you don't get these things, you're not going to have a biblical church if you're not serious about biblical families. Now let me share something with you. There are a lot of people that are talking about family, 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 family integrated churches and things like this. Let me say something at the very beginning that's very important. The family is one thing. The church is another thing. You don't try to put the two together. God has ordained a family and He's given us rules with regard, principles and wisdom with regard to how that family ought to function and what its purposes are. But God has also given us a church. And He's given us in Scripture what the purposes of church should be, how churches are supposed to function. We should not try to bring these two things together. We shouldn't try to say, bring family into church and make family more important than church or make church more important than family or bring the two together. No, we should just obey God with regard to what He says about the family and we should obey God with regard to what He says about the church. That's all. It's, it's very, very simple. Now, the two are not against one another, but they are two different institutions. Okay? I have seen family movements in churches now where only dads give the Lord's Supper to their children and all sorts of things. Or that the, there's no such thing as elders because I'm the head of my home. No, that's not true. There are elders and as a father you are head of your home. But they're two separate things. And they work together. Okay? Now, I want us to look at Genesis for a moment. Chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the ground. Now, there is... Uh, the idea, um, and there's some really there's some truth in it, of dominion, of taking dominion. M men were created. Man was created, not just to sit still, not just to live without purpose. But here we can see that he was commanded. He said, "Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them." Rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the ground. There was the idea that men were called to subdue the earth, to be stewards of God, to take care of the world, to do God's bidding in the world. 
Now, there are some people who've taken that and said, yes, we need to go out and we need to take dominion, and they get all involved in politics and everything else, trying to spread Christianity, and that's what, not what this is teaching. There is a sense in which men, you, males, you are called to take dominion, to be stewards over this earth. But how is that to be done? That is to be done always through the promotion of God's kingdom and God's will. As men, we are to have a purpose. And our purpose is set forth by that perfect man, Jesus Christ. And it is seen so clearly in his model prayer in Matthew 6. He stands there and he says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Sir, every time someone looks at your life, that's what they ought to see. As a man, when they look you in the eye, that's what they ought to see. You are a man consumed with a passion that God's name be holy, that it be separated as special and unique throughout the world. You are working for the coming of His kingdom and the advancement of His will on this planet. You are not about yourself. You are not about your own dreams. You are not about your own plans. You are not about your own needs. You are not about your own wants. You are about Him and the doing of His will. You are a servant of God called to be a steward. Do you understand that? Now, why am I teaching this about the family? Well... In the family, there is a thing that we call headship. The Bible does teach that a man is to lead his family. It does teach that, and if you don't like that, I understand that, but do not call yourself biblical because you're not. You're influenced by your own culture. You're influenced by the teachings of feminism and everything else, but you're not biblical. Okay? Let's just stay that. There is teaching in Scripture about the headship of a man and his family. There is teaching about submission. The wife is to submit to her husband. Many people hate that because of teachings of feminism. Other people hate it because of the massive abuses in regard to that teaching. Now let me just give you an example. Let's go back to what I was teaching about men. If my wife looks at me and she sees a man who is consumed with himself, consumed with his own desires, consumed with his own career, consumed with his own hobbies, maybe even consumed with his religion, consumed with his ministry, consumed with his own religious uh, goals, then when she reads in Scripture that she ought to submit to that man, it creates nothing but anger and bitterness in her life. I'm, gonna have, I'm called to be the helper to this man's purposes, and all his purposes are about him. That just creates bitterness, anger. Okay? But if my wife looks at me and sees a man who has thrown away his own purposes, thrown down his own personal whims and desires, and she sees a man who is given toward this, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. She sees a man given to the purposes of God, then it is a lot easier for her to say, I will work with Him. 
I will submit to that, his leadership, because his leadership is not directed toward his own goals, his own purposes. It's directed toward the will of God. And I see in his life sacrifice. I see in his life desire, passion, and love for others. Thus I will join him. Do you see that? If men have a sin, a specific sin, it is self-centeredness, selfishness. As a matter of fact, most men just marry their mom. They want to marry someone who's going to take care of them just like good old mom took care of them. Now, but let's look at something else. Let's say that that man is all about Lord, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So he's in the ministry 24 hours a day and he is neglecting his wife and he's neglecting his children. Then she looks at that and goes, this is, well, once again, anger, bitterness. As a man... My life must be directed toward hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But my ministry of advancing God's will on this earth should be marked out in concentric circles. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, first of all in me. If I'm going to be a useful servant of the Most High God, his kingdom has to come in me. His will has to come in me. I must be conformed to the image of Christ. I must work on self. In order to be a useful servant, well, I can only be a useful servant to the degree that I am conformed to the image of Christ. My character must change. I must learn to live the principles of Jesus Christ. Of He did not come to serve him to be served but to serve others it let unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies it abideth alone but if it die it bringeth forth much fruit to live the sacrificial cross life of Jesus Christ that of giving your life away so when i talk about thy kingdom come thy will be done i can't be trying to go out and try to advance the kingdom in different places when the kingdom isn't advancing in me. To bring Christianity upon a people when I myself don't live the principles of Christianity. Living the radical Christian life is not listening to Christian music or wearing a t-shirt with a verse on the back of it. It is dying to self in service to others. But where does that service begin? For me? It begins with my wife. It doesn't begin with lost cities. It doesn't begin with countries where the gospel isn't preached. As a man who in the providence of God is now married, my first ministry after dealing with my own conformity, my own need for growth, it is to turn to this woman and to minister to her. Now, what does that look like? Well, we're going to talk about that later. But I am not one flesh with anyone else on this planet. I am one flesh with her. She is the most important person in my life. With regard to priority, she is the most important ministry in my life. Are you getting me? And if I jump over her to minister to others, I'm wrong. I'm just wrong. As a matter of fact, the Bible says... If my ministry toward her is not biblical, I can't even be a leader in the church.
Then after my wife, my next ministry is my children. My children. What does it matter if a man gain the whole world and lose his family? What does it matter if a man evangelize the whole world and lose his family? My next priority are my children. And this is not my decision. This is in the providence of God. In the providence of God, I have a wife. In the providence of God, I have children. And I am to live out the Christian life before her. And I am to live out the Christian life before them. And then from there, it's the people of God. The people of God. One of the things that churches do, probably more than anything else that I've ever seen, is they... Now you listen to me. Now you listen to me very carefully. And I'm talking about sincere men do this. They starve the people of God to death. And then they use them as slaves to advance their own kingdom. Listen to me. Do I care about the lost? No one can accuse me of not caring about the lost. But I can tell you this. I care a lot more about you. Do good unto all men. But first of all, to those of the household of faith. Many churches start and they're all about evangelism, all about evangelism, all about evangelism. Every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday, they're all about evangelism, evangelism. And the sheep are starving to death. The sheep are starving to death. And so they don't feed the sheep, but they get the sheep mobilized to go out there, win a bunch of people, while the sheep are starving to death, their families are a disaster, their children are a disaster, and everything else, but it's a, it's a really going church. So after my wife and after my children, it is the people of God. And then from there, it is the world. It is the world. This is so important. Now, I want us to uh, well, there's so much that I want to I'm just going to have to pick and choose a little bit. I want you to look at verse 18 of chapter 2. I guess we'll just go there. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Now, there are exceptions. Jesus said that there are men who make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. There are men who have, it appears, and women who have a gift, which does not, they have no need of marriage. And that's a wonderful thing. But by and large, it is not good for a man to be alone. Now, it's not only because of sexual desire, but I believe there's another reason. Marriage is probably one of the greatest catalysts or instruments in sanctification. I thought I was spiritual. I mean, I'm preaching in the jungles. I'm going days without food and everything else for the sake of Christ. I, I'm a spiritual man. And I got married and I discovered how unspiritual I truly, truly was. A selfish, immature little brat of a boy who knew nothing about love. Nothing about love. Okay? So marriage is a great instrument to sanctification. But we're going to talk about that in a minute. But I want to just point out something here. It says, I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, these are, you know, these types of passages, this passage, I will make a helper suitable for him and passages like submission, they have to be taught and they're beautiful doctrines, but they're frightening 
And I'll tell you why they're frightening. Not just because they contradict culture. They're frightening because of wicked religious males. That's why they're frightening. Wicked religious males. There is nothing worse on the face of the earth than a man who is unconverted and yet takes the Bible seriously. I, I, I'm, I'm not kidding you. It, it's, it's horrid. When a man starts to try to order his house according to the laws and the commands and the precepts of Scripture and his heart is not converted, he becomes, he becomes a Hitler. He becomes a Nero. It's oppressive. It's bondage. It's it's horrible. The wife is beaten down. The children have no security. It's just horrid. And I have seen men, men who dot every I and cross every T in religion, take verses like this and just use it to oppress their families. And in it of all men, they ought to fear on judgment day when God casts their soul into hell for what they've done. And so I want you to know that I'm aware of that when I teach this and I hate it. We're not talking about a man like that. We're talking about a man who realizes he has been given authority in the home in order to lay down his life for his wife for her benefit and to lay down his life for his children, his children's benefit, the promotion of them. Listen, I can tell what kind of husband you are. I just need to look at your wife. If I see a little battered woman walking four steps behind you, like a wilted flower just crumbling up, I know you're a vicious man, a neglectful man, a selfish man. When men truly live like Christ and become the heads of their home, the wife's life is promoted and blessed and becomes a fruitful vine. The children likewise. Now again, I'm speaking in generalities like in the book of Proverbs. A godly man may have a wife that greatly struggles over things. A godly man may have a wife, that uh, children that struggle over things, but it's not because he's oppressed them. Okay. And so I want you to realize that that these texts are for our blessing. Now, I was created to lead my home. I was regenerated and called to lead my home, and I lead my home. I find my greatest happiness in taking the responsibility to lead my home. It's frightening because I know that I will stand before God one day and have have to give an account of how I took care of His daughter. But at the same time, I want you to know something. My wife finds her greatest joy in being a helper suitable for me. Now the world hates that. Culture hates it. If right now a TV network was in here, they would be putting this all over Denmark. This primitive, prehistoric, Neanderthal teaching. Well, just let me, just let me talk to them for a second. I would say this. Isn't it you that are coming out with all the reports about how society's falling apart, how immorality is rampant, how everything just socially seems to be disintegrating? You have all the answers, but you yourself admit that your entire world is falling apart. Why is it falling apart? Because we've refused to obey our God. Period. Women have been taught that to be a wife and a mother is a horrid thing. 
It's an unusual thing. It's almost sick. It's perverse. You should be out there. You should be, you've got a career. You've got this. You've got that. That's a lie. That's a lie. I'm not saying that women shouldn't and cannot be educated. I'm not saying that they cannot do things outside of the home. And I'm not saying certainly that women are just an extension of their husband. But what I am saying is, as I have said, I will find my greatest joy in being a servant within the context of my family, my wife and my children. My wife will find her greatest joy doing the same thing. I'm not asking her to do something I'm not doing. Do you see what I'm saying? She will find her greatest joy in promoting the kingdom of heaven through her family, as I will find my greatest joy in doing the same. And as I have been called to set a course to obeying God's commands in in advancing His kingdom on this earth, she has been called to come alongside me and help me in this endeavor. Do you see that? I hope so. Now, I want us to go for a moment. Like I said, man, we're really jumping around. Um, I want to go to Romans chapter 8 and show you the purpose of marriage. Romans 8.28 And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. This is one of the most important passages in all the Bible with regard to marriage. You're sitting there going, What? What? For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son. What is the purpose of marriage? A lot of Christian books, even sincere ones, have it very wrong. The purpose of marriage is not to create a little heaven on earth. It's not to fill your life with bliss. It's not to meet all your needs. If I meet all my wife's needs, I've... It's idolatry. If she meets all my needs, it's idolatry. My wife was not created to meet all my needs and I was not created to meet hers. We can't. That's why marriages fall apart. You expect your spouse to do something they were never intended to do. Christ is to meet my wife's needs. Only He can do that. And only Christ can meet mine. Now, what is the purpose of marriage? The purpose of marriage is that through marriage I might become and my wife might become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of marriage. And if you get this, it will make your marriage so strong. Now, I have been called by God into the ministry to preach. I have been called to preach. And you know, as in the, you might not say that this much here in this, this country, but in my country they always say things like, yep, he was called to preach. He turned his back away from his calling and God killed him. You know, God, you, if you, God calls you to preach and you don't preach, God will kill you. Well, I don't know. If, I know if you're out of God's will, you will get disciplined, but I, I'm not so sure God delight so much in killing people. But there is a sense in which I have been called and that calling is irrevocable. It's not based upon me. I didn't make the decision. God called me into the ministry. Now, if it goes good in the ministry, wonderful. If it goes terrible, I'm not going anywhere. Why? Because I didn't get into the ministry for the sake of the ministry or for some benefit to myself. I got into the ministry because God called me to go into the ministry. Now, a young man will come into my office and he's got that look, you know. And I say, what's up? I'm in love. You're in love? Yeah. With who? With so-and-so. Well, and? Oh, I want to marry her. 
Well, why? Sit down. <laughs> well, I want to marry her because she's just, she's just beautiful. And, um, and when we're together, I just feel wonderful. And we, c- we can talk and uh, we just do things together. And I just feel like, man, she completes me. I have a big stick that I use and I have it behind my chair that when they say that, I just slap them in the head with it. <laughs> Wake them up a little bit. And I say, now, okay, now let me see if I'm following you, if I'm understanding what you're saying. You want to marry this girl because she meets all your selfish, self-centered desires. No, that's not what I mean. But young man, that's exactly what you just said. You want to marry her because she's beautiful. What happens when she's not beautiful anymore or when someone else comes along that's more beautiful than she is? What are you going to do? You want to be with her and marry her because you can talk to her. What happens when you can talk to your secretary a lot easier than you can talk with your wife? Because that's going to happen too. So what are you telling me? Do you see the problem? That's why people come together in secular societies. Do you realize that? It's all out of selfish, self-centered desires. And that's why their relationships fall apart. Do you see that? But if you're a secular culture, you have no other reason to come together unless it's for the benefit of the state. I mean, why do you come together? You're not supposed to be... You think being a radical Christian is because you can stand on a park bench and preach? This is radical Christianity. When you say, I'm going to bind myself to a person for life, whether I get any benefit out of it or not, because God's called me to do so. Now, why am I married to Chato Casado de Washer? My wife is from Peru. Why am I married to her? Well, you want the rock-solid basis for it? Now, this isn't all my marriage, but this is, the, this is the foundation of it. I am married to her because in the same way that God called me into the ministry, and that calling is irrevocable, I believe that God has called me to lay down my life for this woman. To lay down my life in service to his daughter. That's, wh- that's why I'm married. You say, well, that's not very romantic. I didn't say that was my marriage. I said that was the foundation of it. Now, look at this. My wife is, 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 is beautiful. She's a little flashy because she's Latin. She's beautiful. Now, Let's say that some sort of chemical imbalance throws off her whole life and she's not beautiful anymore. Or let's say that she's in a car accident and she's crippled. I'm not going anywhere. Why? Because I didn't marry her because she's beautiful. I married her because of an irrevocable calling on my life to lay down my life for a daughter of God. Do you see that? Do you see that? So what happens if, if in our relationship we, we can't talk that much? You know, you pass through those times where it just seems like you're not communicating. I'm not going anywhere because I didn't marry her for that. I married her because God called me. So see, my entire marriage, I don't answer to my wife necessarily. I answer to him. It doesn't see I can argue with her and say, well, you know, I'm not going to love you as Christ loved the church because you don't respect me as Christ tells you to respect me. Well, you don't do that either. So when you start doing it, I'll start doing it. See, I can't do that because it's just God says, both of you shut up. I commanded you to lay down your life for her, whether or not she respects you, appreciates it or corresponds accordingly. You obey me. See, I'm trapped now. I mean, God's got me trapped here. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I want to do. Except obey Him more. 
So you see, our marriage is founded upon this. Now, let's look at something else. You know these dating services on the Internet? Find the person that's compatible to you. Okay? That's kind of scary. Find the person that's compatible to you. Okay. It's not of God. It's not of God. You say, why? Because God usually doesn't do that. I mean, I guess He can, but it's very rare. I want to marry a woman who just loves all the stuff I love. You, you may want to marry a woman who loves all the stuff you love she'll, so that she'll do everything you want to do, you selfish person. God, for the most part, is going to give you a wife or give you a husband that is not compatible to you. And you go, oh man, then maybe I was supposed to marry him. But see, the world tells you just the opposite, don't they? They tell you just the opposite. Why? Because everything the world's going to tell you is selfish and self-centered. They tell you just the opposite. Now, here's the way it's going to be. God will give you a mate who is strong in all the areas where they must be strong so that you are not tempted beyond what you can bear. But God is going to give you a husband, a wife, who does not meet your expectations in many of the areas where you most want him or her to meet your expectations. Why? Because he hates you? Why is he doing this? Well, first of all, many of your expectations are probably carnal and self-centered. But the most important reason is this. When you think about Jesus, what do you think about? Do you think about his wrath, his judgment? I don't. I mean, that's there. But when I think about Jesus, someone said, describe for me, Jesus. What are the first words that pop into your mind with regard to Jesus? It would be unconditional love, grace, and mercy. Okay? Now, you know all those prayers that you make? Lord, I want to be like Jesus. Lord, I want to be conformed to the image of Christ. Okay. God's going to give you a mate who does not meet all the conditions. Why? Because if you're married to a man or a woman who meets all the conditions, you will never learn how to love unconditionally. Do you see that? You see, in marriage, you've got to ask yourself one question. And it's the same question you've got to ask yourself in everything. Do you really want what God wants? And most people, and some of the times, I don't. See, God wants your conformity to the image of Christ. You want a storybook marriage. You want a Hollywood marriage. At least the one on screen, not in the one on real life. God wants you to become conformed to the image of Christ. So He will oftentimes give you a mate who does not meet all the conditions and many times the most important conditions to you. So that you learn to love a person who doesn't meet the conditions. You learn to practice grace. Favor unmerited poured out on this person. Do you see? Do you really want to be like Jesus? This is what marriage is about. And it's, that's, listen, and that's what makes it so wonderful, so real, and makes it so strong. See, most of the people in Denmark, they come together and they go, man, this person's not what I thought, and they're not compatible to me, we need to go out and find our soulmates. What they're saying is, this person didn't meet my self-centered, selfish desires. I'm going to go find somebody who can. Christianity enters into this relationship with this person. And when things are wonderful, and marriage can be wonderful, and there are times it's wonderful, you say, wow, this is great. 
But in those times of conflict, you're not shaken. You're not thinking that you're made the mistake of marrying the wrong person. None of that. You know that this is the purpose. These little conflicts, these things going on, so that you will learn not to conform your wife to your own image, but you will learn to love her. You will learn to love him. And here's the thing, you can try all day long to make your wife like you or you can try to make your husband like you and it's not going to work. What you've both got to do is set your sights on becoming like Christ. It's like spokes on a bicycle wheel. Those spokes never touch. But as this spoke is headed toward the axle and this spoke is headed toward the axle, they both come together. As my wife and I, my wife and I are two very, very different people. Very different. But as she is headed toward Christ, conformity to Christ, and I'm headed toward conformity to Christ, we come together. And the differences in our lives have been used by God to show me how unlike Christ I truly am. I'll give you an example. This, is, this embarrasses me to tell you but I'm going to tell you. When I got married, I thought my wife and I would be a Batman and Robin team. You know, tag team wrestling, uh, going out there, witnessing in the streets and all kinds of stuff. My wife, when she opens the Bible, it's amazing. I mean, the, the woman, you know, can just look at a passage and just start saying all kinds of wise things. She can write and all kinds of things. And, and I was just, but she wouldn't. And I would be like, Look, you're, you're just so gifted. You're wasting your life. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? And, you just, and I'd get so frustrated. And one day she broke down crying in front of me. And she said, I just want to be your wife. See, I was trying to make her in my image. She said, I just want to be your wife. Let me throw something at you really quick. Pastor's wives. Boy, if there was ever a title out of the pit of hell, that's one of them. A a pastor's wife. Pastor's wife. Now, listen, when I was pastoring... And I married Chato. And everybody says, okay, she's the pastor's wife. She's supposed to lead the women's thing. She's supposed to do this. She's supposed to do that. And one day, I just had to straighten it all out. So I got up in the pulpit and I said, look, I'm called to be pastor. I don't see any place in the Bible where she's called to be the pastor's wife. She's called to be my wife, not yours. She is to be a Christian. She is to grow in Christ. She is to minister according to her gifts and her callings. She is not the pastor's wife. She is a person with her own unique callings and everything else. She will be godly as Christians ought to be godly. She will be a part of this fellowship as Christians ought to be part of the fellowship, but do not heap upon her something God has not put upon her. Okay? Now, when people meet my wife, they're like, man, Paul Washer's wife. You know, she's, man, she's probably, what, she preaches on the streets, she does all this stuff. And then they, they get really disappointed. Because this is what my wife does. She goes to church. On Sunday, she goes to church on Wednesday. Over the internet, women will correspond with her and ask for her help. Every once in a while, every once in a while, she'll do a conference. She'll counsel girls, things like that, that'll come to our home and have need. But my wife's ministry, she says, look, my wa- I have two ministries. My first ministry is my husband. My second ministry are my children. She dedicates her entire life to that. That's her calling. That's what she wants to do. 
Okay? Now, why am I saying that? Your wife, if you're in the ministry, your wife is not an extension of you. She's called to be your helper. But do you realize what it takes for a woman to manage an entire home? Do you realize what it takes for a woman to help you with the discipleship of your children? In our case, we homeschool. So my wife is teaching every day our children. It's a full-time, full-time job. Okay? So God brings two people together who oftentimes aren't super compatible so that they would be conformed to the image of Christ. And after the years, you begin to see the wisdom in that. And it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Now, let me share something with you about... So we, can't, we haven't even really touched on anything. Let, let, let me share with you something about wife and children. Now, this is a terrible illustration. And it's kind of shocking. And in reality, it's probably not going to happen. But I just use it in order to give you an idea of the way a family ought to be. If I'm in a boat with my wife and my three children, and I'm the only one who can swim, and the boat goes under, who do I save? I save my wife. Now, why do I say that? Well, boy, how do I do all this? The time I have. have you ever heard the statement, there's no love like a mother's love? Have you ever heard that statement? There's just no love like a mother's love. Well, I don't find that anywhere in the Bible. I do see that there's no love like a father's love. Now, I'm going to say some things, and some of you women now, listen to me. If I see you're about to jump out of your chair and run towards me, I'm, I'm running out the door. Okay, don't get angry with me. Just listen to me. There is a sense in which there's a mother's love and and that's a wonderful thing. But most women love their children in a parasitic way. I know that sounds ugly. Most women are like parasites on their children. And here's why. The husband is not meeting the needs of his wife with regard to love, affection, warmth, tenderness, all the things that he ought to be doing for her. And so she gets it from her children. And that is why later on in life when that son of hers meets a special girl that he wants to marry, that mom becomes a demon. Because for her, that girl that just came into his life is like an adulteress. She's taking away her source, the mother's source of love and affection and warmth. Holds on to the children. Now listen to me. My two boys and my little girl will be the happiest children on the face of the earth if they know that their daddy loves their mommy more than any other human being on the face of the earth. And they will be the happiest children in the world if they know their mother loves their father more than any human being on the face of the earth because they're going to sit there and go, Mom and Dad's not going anywhere. This family is rock solid. They're also going to learn to respect their mother because those boys aren't the most important thing in my life. Their mother is. And they will learn to respect her as the most important person to me. My daughter, if she sees me love her mother as I ought to, it will save her from a horrible life. Why? Your daughter is not going to marry any higher than you, Dad. 
And if you mistreat her mother, she'll probably marry a man who does the same because all she'll know is that's what a husband does. He neglects his wife. He treats her as common. So she'll marry a boy who does the same thing to her. But if I love her mother as her mother ought to be loved, when some little boy comes along and says, I love you, she'll just look at him and laugh. You don't even know what love is. I know what love is. I've seen my father do it for 20 years. Go talk to my father. Learn from him and then come back and talk to me. Do you see? Now, these are just a few things. But we haven't even gotten into things like children, their teaching, their training, and their discipline. Foreign words, completely foreign. Why? Because in your culture, as well as mine, parents don't teach their children. They don't train their children and they don't discipline their children. The state or someone else teaches their children, trains their children, and nobody disciplines them. All the things the Bible commanded you to do, you've handed over to the state. And that's why families are falling apart. The idea of the proper way to seek a mate. Do you know what the Bible teaches regarding that? The proper way to help your children seek a mate. How to be involved in that enterprise. See, here's the thing. Let me finish with this. Let's say that you've got a big bloody wound on your forehead. Okay? Just this big bloody wound. Horrible. And you come up to me and go, Brother Paul, um, I need some counsel. Okay. I've got this bloody wound on my head, and I pretend like I haven't noticed it. I've got this bloody wound on my head, and um, no one can figure out where it's coming from. And could you just pray about it, see if the Lord shows you something? So I go, sure. You know, so... I decide, pray about it, and the Lord says, well, follow the person around for 24 hours. Okay. So I follow you around. I start at midnight. And I follow you around. And all of a sudden, the bell chimes 1 o'clock. Ding. And you walk over to a brick wall, and you go, bam, and hit yourself right in the forehead. And I go, well, that, that's interesting. And then I follow you and it's 2 o'clock. And the, the bell on the clock goes, ding, ding. And you walk right over to a wall and go, bam, bam. And I follow you for 24 hours. I mean, we get to 12 o'clock noon and you're like this. I mean, 12 o'clock hits and you're like just like a woodpecker on a tree just beating your head against a concrete wall. So you, you come to me the next day and said, Brother Paul, has the Lord showed you anything? I said, yeah, um, look, I'm no doctor, but I think I figured out what your problem is. What's that? Every time the bell chimes, you hit your head against a brick wall. Yeah, well, stop it and your bloody wound will go away. He told Israel in Isaiah 1, he said, from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, there's not one healthy part in you. Why will you continue doing this? What was, it, what was happening? God said, do this. And they said, no. Or God said to do this. And they didn't even know what God said. Does that describe you? Why are my relationships messed up? Why is my family messed up? Why is this happening? Why is that happening? Now, again, let me say this though. A man or woman can seek to do the things that God has shown them and still things don't go right all the time. For example, a person may not beat their head against a wall 
uh, several times a day, but they may have a brain tumor that didn't come from anything that they did. Or there may be secret works of providence going on that no one can really understand. I'm not telling you that if you, like many teachers today, that if you do all these different things, everything in your life is going to turn out wonderful. But I will tell you this, you will avoid much harm. And things will function better. It's like a man who comes to me and goes, I just have a problem. I get in fights all the time. Really? He goes, yeah. Where? In bars. Okay, stop going to bars and you won't get in fights. Doesn't mean someone won't walk up to him on a street corner and just punch him right in the mouth sometimes, but he's going to get in a whole lot less fights if he stops going into the bar. It's the same way. If you begin to learn what God says with regard to every aspect of your life, things will go better. They really will. All right, well, let's pray. Father, I come before you and, and ask you to use this, use this to help your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, real quick, I, I brought a book up here that I, I really want to recommend to you because it's just so balanced. It's called Teach Them Diligently by Lou Priolo. Teach Them Diligently. And um, the, the neat thing about this book is he... Um, he does teach discipline, and uh, maybe maybe we can have another class or something before we leave, and I can talk to you about that. But he teaches discipline, but here's what you need to understand. Discipline is something that happens way, way, way down the road after you have invested time in teaching, time in training. We have a rule at my home. I try to finish my work at least by 5 o'clock, five times a week. Get up as early as I have to so that I can finish by 4.30 and I come home. Now, we have a rule. When I come home, the children are mine. The moment I walk in that door, they're mine. They no longer belong to their mom. They're mine. Mom has had them all day. They're mine. To invest my life in them. Why did I have children? Question. Why do you have children? If you're going to have someone else raise them, train them, teach them everything else. So when dad comes home, he doesn't sit in his lazy boy chair and just relax. They're mine until they go to bed. And I put them to bed. I'm not trying to point to myself. I'm just saying my work hasn't stopped when I have just provided for my family. I provide for my family just so I can get home to be able to be with my family. And when those kids go to bed, then it's their mom. And when mom goes to bed, then I can go to bed. Do you see that? If you don't want to do these types of things, then just be single. Okay? All right. This is uh, Teach Them Diligently, How to Use the Scriptures in Child Training, Lou Priolo. I'll just set it here if anyone wants to look at it, but it's a great book. All right, Kim.